Good afternoon. Welcome to Division 7 of the Court of Appeals. We have two cases on the 130 docket this afternoon. First is EcoBlast versus Country Mutual. The second is Big Sur Waterbeds versus the City of Lakewood. Uh, I see that counsel have set up for the first argument. Are counsel also present for the second argument? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Okay, uh, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, I'm, uh, have you had a chance to look at our written procedures uh, for the argument? Do you have any questions about those? Okay. Um, the only thing I would like to remind, uh, well, a couple things I'd like to remind you of. Uh, if anybody in the audience has any cell phone, uh, you need to turn those off, please, not just to vibrate. Uh, for some reason, even having them on can potentially interfere with our recording and live streaming. Um, I don't understand why, but that's what I'm told. Um, also, just remember for those of you who are arguing that the podium does raise and lower, I think there's a little toggle switch on there. Uh, with us today are Judge Tony Navarro and Senior Judge Bob Kapelke sitting on division. If there are no further questions, we're ready to proceed. Good afternoon, your honors, and may it please the court. My name is Rodney Monheit. My attorney registration number is 48919. I represent the plaintiff appellant in this matter, EcoBlast LLC. I'd like to begin by reciting the rule in Colorado. That is, the reasonableness of an insurance company's conduct is measured objectively based on proof of industry standards. The issue for the court today is which industry standards are we talking about when we're judging an insurance company's conduct? The answer, I think, is simple. Insurance industry standards. We do not judge insurance companies based on construction industry standards or general contracting industry standards or subcontracting industry standards. We hold insurance companies accountable to insurance industry standards. And so in this case, EcoBlast presented proof of insurance industry standards through an expert witness, Scott Shepard, and through a Division of Insurance Bulletin B5.1. Uh, the evidence provided the jury with information about certain characteristics of an insurance benefit called general contractors overhead and profit, uh, which I will refer to as OMP. And what we learned about OMP at trial during EcoBlast's case in chief um, is this. First, an insurance company's decision to pay OMP is made at the beginning stages of a claim. Uh, for example, when an insurer, uh, an adjuster first evaluates the claim um, and adjusts the property loss, uh, it writes its first check for the actual cash value of the loss. And at that moment, that's when an insurance company makes the decision whether or not to apply overhead and profit, OMP. The next thing we learned from the industry standards is that insurance companies decided to apply OMP based on the three trade test. So if that initial adjuster at the uh, initial adjustment uh, determines that there are gonna be three or more trades involved in performing the repairs, the adjuster should, a reasonable insurance company should apply OMP and write and incorporate that into the actual cash value payment to the insured. Another important note is that OMP is paid without regard to whether the insured actually makes the repairs. It's paid regardless of whether a general contractor is actually hired. It is incorporated as part of the actual cash value of the loss. And so the facts of this case demonstrated that Country Mutual did not follow these industry standards. Uh, the insurer counted seven trades in its initial adjustment. Um, and as an aside, three, three subcontractors testified at trial with respect to their respective trades that they performed on the property. Uh, the Country Mutual also did not pay OMP with the ACV payment, despite having counted seven trades. Counsel, uh, yes. it seems to me your case really boils down to an assertion that by including seven trades, and I'll use air quotes there, uh, in the estimate, in the initial estimate, that's some kind of a binding admission as to how many trades were involved. Is that really your position? Uh, no, Your Honor. It, it's, it boils down to what a reasonable insurance company should do in its initial adjustment if they count seven trades. And 
in the record, I mean, there were seven different trades. But, but yes. didn't, didn't the person who actually wrote that testify that those were not, in fact, seven trades? Those were simply seven different types of work that needed to be done, but there could be one person in a particular trade who could do multiple of those items. It depends on who you're referring to that said that. I'm talking about the person who wrote it. Okay. I mean, it seems that to me was her Jennifer testimony to... is the most relevant to that. Sure. And, and I mean, I have the transcripts right in front of me. And it's, it's actually in the court file, page 1598. Uh, question on examination, okay, and you can tell us in your estimate, if you can slow it down, how many trades did you identify in your July 16th, 2014 estimate? Answer, there are seven. Question, seven trades? All right. So when you wrote this estimate, you believed there were seven trades. Is that correct? Answer, yes. So, I mean, perhaps she changed her testimony when her counsel asked her similar questions, but I don't think this matters because our, or my client, Ecoblast, expert, the insurance industry standards expert, the only one qualified to testify about insurance industry standards in this case, also testified that he reviewed the estimate, the subject estimate, written by that person, and saw seven trades as well. And that's uh, from trial day three, it's in the transcripts, 032917 trial, PDF page number 54, lines nine through 17. So, our industry standards expert looked at the same exact estimate and counted seven trades. So if the question here is whether a reasonable insurance company in these circumstances would have counted seven trades and then subsequently applied OMP and issued payment, I think we've established that. Uh, and, and there's nothing left from the other side that rebutted that evidence. Well, except that there was uh, Ms. DeWolf's own testimony saying that, in fact, those were not trades, those were line items, those were things that had to be done, but those were not trades. She's the one who wrote it, so it seems to me that rebuts that. And, and also, let me, let me give you an example. Let's say this involved an automobile accident, okay? Or, I mean, it seems to me you're saying that an insurer couldn't rely on, on the opinion of a person who repairs cars as to what the damage was and how much it should cost. It, it seems to me you're kind of trying to draw that line. In other words, in this case, it's a construction industry expert, but in the automobile case, why couldn't the insurance company go to somebody who repairs automobiles and ask them, how much is this? How, what needs to be fixed, et cetera? I mean, isn't that uh, part of the industry standard is to look at somebody who knows this area and say, and tell me how many trades are involved here? Uh, okay, there's two points there. First. She is not an expert. She was never qualified to be an expert in the insurance industry standards. Um, as to the second question, couldn't an insurance company rely on people outside of their field or outside of their industry? And the answer is yes, of course. But there has to be some evidence showing that that is proper, that that is what a reasonable insurance company would do, that a reasonable insurance company would ask a mechanic or would ask a construction professional uh, to count the trades for them. But that evidence is non-existent in this case. There was never an industry standard that says, uh, that was brought about by neither the plaintiff nor the defendant, that a reasonable insurance company in these circumstances would have consulted a construction professional and arrived at its conclusion that way. Well, it seems to me to get back to um, what I think your case is based on, it seems to boil down to, okay, Ms. DeWolf wrote down seven trades, and your expert looked at that same document and said that's seven trades. That seems to be your case. Is that it? Primarily. I mean, okay, there, there's well, a little. That wasn't all the evidence, though. I mean, we had, we had Ms. DeWolf say those weren't seven trades, and we had, we had the experts say, no, there are really only two trades needed to do all of these seven line items. That so was, there's conflicting evidence, is my point. But the, the conflicting evidence comes from, I believe, the construction industry standards expert that said, oh, there's actually two trades. And I don't believe that a construction industry standards expert is competent to testify as to what a reasonable insurance company would do, nor how a reasonable insurance company would count those trades. Well, I'm having a hard time figuring out what a, a, an insurance industry person is supposed to do except consult a construction industry expert. We're talking about construction. Again, I think it comes down to having an insurance it's about evidence. Like, there needs to be objective evidence of industry standards. 
of insurance industry standards. All Country Mutual needed to do was say, a reasonable insurance company would have done the exact same thing as us, and here's the evidence for it. But there is no objective evidence of insurance industry standards that supports Country Mutual's decision here. And this really brings me to what I think reasonableness means under CRS 1031115. And it's been stated in common law bad faith claims in a case such as uh, Bankruptcy Estate of Morris v. Copic Insurance Company, but more recently it's been applied in the statutory bad faith case as we have here in SIPES v. Allstate, S-I-P-E-S v. Allstate, 949 F sub 2nd 1079 at 1085, where the Honorable, Honorable Judge Brimmer stated, the question is whether a reasonable insurer under the circumstances would have similarly denied or delayed payment of the claim. And that's what we're focused on. Country Mutual needed some evidence that a reasonable insurance company would have acted the same way as they did. But subjective evidence from the adjuster saying what I did was reasonable is not objective evidence. That's, that, that's purely subjective. But why, why isn't your expert's opinion subjective? I'm because confused. it's an outside observer. Who's paid by your side. I'm, I'm confused. It's still just a subjective opinion. Now, he's purporting to opine as to what the standard is, but so is she. She's not an expert. And, and the general rule is that expert testimony is required to, for, to, to, uh, to demonstrate industry standards. That's the general rule. That's Goodson v. American Standard Insurance Company of Wisconsin. It's a Supreme Court case from 2004. I'm, 100% sure it's cited in the briefs. Uh, there's an exception to that general rule that expert testimony is not required when a lay person, it's in the common uh, knowledge of a lay person, or when a statute or regulation or a rule uh, provides valid evidence of what the standard of care is. And that those are the two exceptions. And that comes from American Family Mutual Insurance Company versus Allen, another 2004 Supreme Court case. Uh, so I'm I'm certain that expert testimony is required in this case because actual cash value payments and overhead and profit are not general terms that a lay, wit a lay person or a lay witness can properly talk about or understand without an expert with knowledge of the insurance industry. Counsel? Yes. Can I ask a quick question? I, later on, Country, Music, Country Mutual paid the overhead and profit. Did it explain its change of position? No, I don't believe so. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was a letter uh, that was sent with it that merely said, this is the check for overhead and profit that you are entitled to, addressed to the insured, and that's how it was paid. It was after uh, demand for appraisal, and then they just paid it. And they said, you are entitled to this. There was no reservation of rights. It was, here you go. And that was nine months after what the objective insurance industry standards dictated from the trial when it should have been paid from the first actual cash value payment. Thank you. Counsel, uh, this was a jury trial. And in a jury trial or in a trial to the court, even if evidence is supposedly uncontradicted as you contend yours was, the fact finder is free to disregard it, um, even if it's expert testimony. And we have plenty of case law that says that. Why couldn't the jury have simply disregarded your people's testimony? Because I think the standard is a preponderance of the evidence, and I think it's the same standard as it is for directed verdict and for motion for summary judgment. Sure, that if there's no, if the evidence is unrebutted, I don't see why an insurance company can't be deemed unreasonable as a matter of law. It goes the other way. In other cases, it's, it says, you know, if, you know, if the evidence is uncontroverted, uh, reasonableness may be decided as a matter of law. Why can't an insurance company be unreasonable as a matter of law? If there is no objective industry standard that they have adhered to, I don't believe it's, it's proper that it can just be disregarded and confusion can be injected into the case in all sorts of ways, and then you're left with... Why can't your expert's credibility be examined by a jury? That seems to be what you're saying. I mean, why can't they listen to him and say, we don't believe him? I suppose that's possible, Your Honor. I just I don't know the procedural grounding for why that would be okay to disregard on a directed verdict stage or in a uh, 
summary judgment stage. Well, it's property disregard because it is an issue of fact that's up to the jury to decide as a matter of credibility in part. So that's why the judge lets it go to the jury because the jury does not have to believe your witnesses. The, the, the determination of whether there is an issue of fact is itself a legal issue. If there is no issue of fact, there is no reason to have a trier of fact review anything. And that is itself a purely legal issue. <clears throat> Counsel, quick question. Did the policyholder here assign his or her rights under the policy to EcoBlast? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I, you don't have to go into a lot of detail. I just wanted to double check that. I just know the record where sure. it is. It's court file, uh, PDF page number 1793 to 94. It's front and back, and there is a, a paragraph for assignment. Great, thank you. If there are no further questions, I'd like to reserve what time I have left for rebuttal, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honors. Jack Robinson on behalf of Country Mutual Insurance Company, uh, attorney registration number 22037. May it please the court. Um, you know, the, the threshold issue here is, I mean, almost the only issue here is, is whether O&P is, uh, is warranted given the facts of this case at all. And that's a construction industry standard, not an insurance industry standard. There is no, I mean, the policy does not even provide for overhead and profit, although um, it is, is known in the construction industry that certain, certain repair projects, certain rebuild projects require um, a general contractor to coordinate um, uh, different trades. But again- is, is there anything in the record that explains why the country changed its mind and, and in fact paid for the OMP? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so uh, I'm going to digress just a second, Sorry. but I am going to answer that question okay. in that um, uh, Mr. Dojan, the insured, uh, had a, a contract uh, for the sale of his property when this hail damage occurred, and he was, very, he was under um, a lot of pressure to get the actual work done. And so country went about um, uh, creating an estimate just to get the ball rolling, just to get a a ballpark number so that he can get a check in his hands, he can hire a, a roofing contractor and get this going. Um, and uh, and so, anyway, she, Ms. DeWolf, uh, the adjuster, uh, creates a, an estimate in the amount of, say, $20,000 with seven, you know, changing a light fixture, combing some HVAC, doing some painting, um, and then high impact uh, created an estimate as well, $19,000 less, and that didn't include O&P either. And so the work's done, um, and months later, they get a, an invoice out of the blue from High Impact, EcoBlast, for $30,000. And, um, and so country asked for documentation. What, what is, you know, you had a contract for 19, you're sitting an invoice for $30,000, there's no support to it at all. Um, and so country asked for, for documentation. Where does this ONP come from? Where, where does this extra uh, $10,000 come from? No response, just gets an, another invoice. Again, another letter, where's the documentation? No response from High Impact. And this goes on for, for quite a while. And finally, High Impact, um, Garrett Kurt, uh, files a, a demand for appraisal. Just without providing any documentation, anything says, you know, I'm, I'm demanding appraisal under the insurance policy and names himself as the appraiser. And this has gone on long enough. Country has an insured to take care of. Finally, it says, you know what? To settle this claim, it's only four or $5,000. We're just going to pay it. And so they paid it. They didn't pay it because at the end of the day, they believed that this required a general contractor or that O&P was really required, but rather we had ratcheting up... Um, um, you know, claim dispute, not with the insured. Insured was fine with everything. It was high impact claims. It was Garrett Kurtz that was ratcheting this up, taking this toward litigation. Country Mutual finally says, you know what? Um, we never received the documentation. We've never seen justification for O&P, but in an effort to settle this on behalf of our insured who we're trying to protect, we'll pay it. And that's- Thank you. Thanks. Um, Council, let me, let me see if I can get to 
kind of what I see as the heart of this. It seems to me that um, what EcoBlast is saying is that, okay, um, Country Mutual had an expert in construction industry standards right. testify, but what was missing was somebody to testify that it is appropriate for an insurance company to rely on a construction industry professional in determining the number of trades involved. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be disputed that it is uh, the industry standard in the insurance industry to pay OMP if you have at least three trades. So could you address that? Because that seems to be the heart of the matter. That is the heart of the matter. And I think the three trades is, you know, again, I agree with you. I think the insurance industry uh, standard, if you will, because again, there's no mention of O&P or overhead and profit or general contractors or who's going to, you know, the insurance policy is only going to pay for what the contract says. We'll pay the damages, you know, reasonably necessary to repair or rebuild, you know. And then we have this ACV issue. Uh, then we have an RCV issue. And the ACV uh, is really um, intelligent minds try to come together to determine, you know, just what is a reasonable cost of repair for this not including, say, depreciation. Um, and let's get a check in the insurance company or insurance hands to get this work going. And once we get all the invoices, once we, the work's completed, if it is completed, then we'll figure out exactly how much this, this costs. And so you get to this issue of, of O&P, which is really more, you know, is this a complex enough repair job that we need a general contractor to coordinate distinct trades. And so when you just say, and, and I thought, you know, your question to counsel uh, before was, was right on track. I mean, you can say the word trade, or you can say the, you know, list, the, the line item uh, repair list, fixing a light bulb. You don't need an electrician to fix a light bulb. You don't, you know, and um, putting on a little bit of paint, although we considered it, or the expert considered it a trade, Mr. Dojan um, supplied the paint there's a small area that needed to be painting, to be painted, but we thought that requires some coordination of, of trades, such that, all right, do we want that guy doing that when the, the roof is being rebuilt and, and uh, um, the gutters put on, we think there's some coordination there, but two trades. And so I guess to answer your question is, is that the insurance industry standard is, is when is, uh, uh, you know, when is O&P, required under a policy, well, three trades. Then what is, what is three trades? That is a construction industry standard. Just on your example with. But the gap here, counsel, the gap that I think we need to focus on, again, I don't think it's undisputed that the industry standard is three trades. Right. And I don't think it's, well, it was disputed, but there was, there was testimony by a construction industry expert that right. this didn't involve three trades. This wasn't the kind of project that needed a general mm -hmm. contractor. Right. So. The gap, though, is somebody to tie those two together and say it is appropriate for an insurance company to rely on this construction industry standard as a matter of insurance industry standards. Where is that testimony? Where is that evidence in the record? Well, I don't believe that there's necessarily testimony to that, to that fact. Um, but I think that it's, you know, again, uh, I, I would say it's not common knowledge, but it goes back to your, your hypothetical um, or your example about the car repair. How much is it going to, to take to repair this car? Um, this, and you rely upon a car repair expert to give you an estimate. Now, an insurance adjuster could give you an estimate as well, but, but certainly if a car repair, uh, an expert in car repair says, here's how much it's gonna cost, here's the complexity to it, here's what's involved, then an, insur an insurance adjuster certainly has, um, you know, the ability to rely upon that professional. And that can, you know, that can, that example or that hypothetical could, could be uh, extrapolated to other, to other areas as well. You know, including, including medicine as far as, you know, future medical treatment or past, or well, not past medical treatment, but the reasonableness of, of past medical treatment that you're relying upon experts in the field to tell you what trades do we need, an anesthesiologist, do we need, um, 
you know, a neurologist, you're relying upon the experts. Certainly insurance professionals have some level of expertise in adjusting a loss and getting this, but they, in all aspects, rely upon, upon those experts. And again, in this case, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're just talking about O&P, right? But at the end of the day, um, the invoice by, by high impact um, included many other items that was not included in the original invoice. And uh, country relied upon high impact as being the professional in, in doing this work to, to pay for those, to pay for those items. So again, the threshold issue in this case, maybe the only issue in this case, is whether O&P, whether a general contractor required to coordinate these trades was warranted given the circumstances of this case. And that's a purely, purely factual issue. And the jury answered no. The secondary issue is whether country delayed payment of O&P. And again, the jury answered no to that as well. And, and again, just I know this wasn't really brought out in counsel's argument, but reading the briefs, it's important to realize that this is not a denial case. This is a, a delayed payment case. And so this issue of, of um, whether country had a, an obligation to pay O&P at the outset of the claim or when it initially made payment or whether it denied O&P at that time, that is sort of a, that's a red herring. Country didn't believe at that time, or really ever, that O&P was warranted for this claim. And so there's no denial of, of O&P at the time. There's actually no real denial of O&P for, uh, I can't even remember whether there was a denial of, of O&P. Rather, High Impact didn't have O&P in its estimate. Country didn't have O&P in their estimate. Payments were made, work was completed. High Impact submitted an invoice that now included O&P. Country asked for documentation to support the work that had been done, how many trades are out there, um, what justifies this $330,000. Um, the information never came, never came, never came, never came, despite repeated requests. Again, we have this request for appraisal, and then finally Country's like, you know what, let's get this thing done, let's pay it. Mr. Kurt was fully paid. Um, Mr. Dojan um, was taken care of well before this. Really, this case is about high, high planes or high impact. Um, I'm not sure what they're trying to get. They got the OMP. They're trying to get a penalty, I guess, based upon that delayed payment plus attorney's fees. That's what this case is. At the end of the day, that's what the damages in this case is about. Mr. Robinson, yes. how much time elapsed between um, high impacts request express request for OMP and the actual ultimate payment of the OMP. Right, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I was looking for that very thing that that last, because um, there was a couple different invoices that were submitted. I think uh, council would have that information. I know it was at least a couple months. Okay, that's fine. I can look into it. And if there's no further questions, I would rest. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. I will be brief. Uh, the first point. OMP is part of the insurance contract. Other courts have interpreted it as being part of the actual cash value. Uh, those cases are cited in the reply brief and for your reference. Uh, the second thing is that a red herring sort of flew into the courtroom throughout this entire proceeding uh, where it was sort of flipped around and the spotlight was shined on EcoBlast. But as the insurance industry expert opined, uh, OMP is paid regardless of whether repairs are actually done, whether a general contractor is hired at all. And so the denial that happened before EcoBlast was even hired to perform the repairs, that is the uh, subject or the, the, the point at which the, the statute, the law was broken. 
Thank you, Council. Thanks. We're out of time. Thank you to both Council for your arguments this afternoon. Uh, case will be deemed submitted. We'll issue an opinion in due course. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, take your leave, and we will. Good afternoon, my name is Patrick Wilson on behalf of the appellant, the city of Lakewood. The trial court erred in canceling the city's use tax assessment on the taxpayer's use of floor models. The question here is whether taxpayers' initial purchase of the demonstration furniture should continue to be treated as a tax-exempt wholesale purchase, i.e. a purchase for resale, in light of the taxpayer's subsequent use and failure to sell or resell the furniture. The test under the A.B. Hirschfeld versus City and County of Denver case is whether the primary purpose of the transaction is the acquisition of the item for resale in an unaltered condition and basically unused by the purchaser. Here the taxpayer uses the demonstration models for months primarily to sell to facilitate the sale of other inventory out of its warehouse. During this use time, the floor models are not sold to customers except in limited circumstances, such as when taxpayer is finished using the item as a demonstration model, or if a customer has an exigent or emergency situation and needs to have the furniture that day. Instead, consummated sales are fulfilled out of the warehouse and delivered to the, taxpayer, to the customers, uh, either truck or home. The display items here are both altered and used. And in interpreting the city's tax code and applying the applicable, applicable case law, the district court made at least six material errors of law. And I'll go through those one at a time. Council, before we get to those, I, I, want, I have a question about the standards we have to apply in this okay. kind of a context. Yes. Um, because there's, there's one standard we apply when we're talking about whether uh, a transaction is initially taxable, that mm -hmm. is deemed to be initially taxable, and there's a different standard we apply if an exception to that is at issue. Correct. And there seems to be some confusion, and frankly, I'm a little confused. It seems to me Lakewood has to establish that there was a retail sale under the use tax ordinance. You must establish a retail sale. And Absent that, there can't be any use taxation. So how are we dealing with an exception here? I, I think it's just the opposite. I think it's the, it's the exemption that has to be proven by the taxpayer. No, the, I, the trial I understand, court, but what exemption are we dealing with? The, the, it's, it's under, I think it's 3-1-230 section B. It's the exemption for wholesale purchases in the Lakewood City's code. It's, um, like I said, I think it's section 230 in the exhibits. Um, is what uh, is the exemption that the taxpayer relies upon. Well, and, and here well the I have the provision here. It says it's, it's a definition of retail sale, mm -hmm. which is all sales except wholesale sales made within the city. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that still means you have to establish that it wasn't a, a wholesale sale. Well, I don't think that the city has the burden of proof on any element in this case. We weren't the plaintiffs. So the, the taxpayer has the burden. Uh, well, I guess to disprove a I'm, retail talking about, I'm talking about how we construe the statutes. I understand. Okay, we construe it narrowly in one circumstance sure. and broadly in the other. And, and I, I understand that you know what the confusion is. But if you look at um, what the district court found in this case, the district court found that there was that this was an exemption, and the exemption should be construed narrowly with all reasonable doubts uh, construed against the taxpayer. Um, and that ruling wasn't appealed in this case. 
Also, look at the city of. Uh, well, uh, they don't. They don't have to appeal. They won. Um, right. They don't. They don't have to appeal. Okay. They can defend the judgment on any ground supported by the record. Sure. Well, look at the um, the Coors Brewing versus uh, City of Golden case. Same. You know different factual context for sure, but in that case, the court found that it was an exemption um, that, the, that Coors Brewing had to, had to uh, establish. It was their burden to prove, and it had to be construed narrowly against um, the taxpayer. And I think that's the same situation. I don't believe the standard of care was addressed in the A.B. Hirschfeld case, but I would submit between the district court's ruling here and the Coors Brewing case, this is an exemption case. They're asking to be exempted from the default, which is that all sales of, ta of tangible personal property are subject to tax. No, it says all retail sales. All retail sales, correct. Okay, so don't, you, don't we have to look at whether this was a retail sale? Don't we have to interpret that uh, narrowly, because that's the, that's the statute or the ordinance that gives the initial right to tax. I think you could read it either way, Your Honor. I think you could read it either way. However, this case was a, was a case about an exemption. It was a claimed exemption. We litigated an exemption, and the exemption is what the taxpayer has to prove. I, I understand. What, what, what is that? What is the exemption? The exemption is all sales that are wholesale are exempt from taxation. That's the exemption. Section 230 of the City of Lakewood's Code. But counsel, isn't part of the problem, or at least in part of my confusion, is the actual imposition part of the ordinance in which defines retail sale itself within the definition contains an exception. So right. is, that a, is that interpreting the imposition or is that interpreting an exemption? In, in this case, the, court, the district court found that it was, an, it was interpreting an exemption. And that's, that's the case that we litigated was the exemption under Section 230 of the Lakewood City Code. Um, I understand what, the, what you're saying. The word retail or for resale is, is in, the, in the definitional section. But the imposition statute says all, taxes, all, all tr sales of tangible personal property at retail. And you're right. Maybe, th maybe that has to be proven. But... This case was tried as an exemption case. The first error that I'd like to address uh, that the district court made was that it, the district court clearly felt that it had to find physical damage, wear and tear, and a loss of marketability in order to find a taxable interim use of the furniture. That is not correct. While such physical damage might be evidence of a taxable interim use, it is not a required finding. The A.B. Hirschfeld test is whether an item is resold in an unaltered condition and basically unused. Here, the district court found that the floor models were in an unused condition, focusing on the physical deterioration or lack thereof, but there was no finding that the floor models were basically unused, and nor could there be such a finding. <clears throat> Damage or physical alteration is not required. The city's initial use regulation, something that was not present in the A.B. Hirschfeld case, um, clarifies that the use tax applies to items used by the taxpayer, even if they're resold in their original condition. Um, so thus, gentle use, if you will, it can be a taxable uh, event, even if the product is not depleted or damaged or somehow um, showing signs of wear and tear and lack of marketability. The but city's council, initial use... Go sorry ahead. to interrupt you, but on, on that sort of the opposite side of that same coin is not all use is taxable as under the use tax, under the For express sure. wording of the tax exemption. It says it exempts use of property purchased for resale. So don't we have to first determine whether this was property purchased for resale? Because even if, if that's so, it doesn't matter if it was used because if the exemption would apply. Right. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following you, but I think that the, the case in this, the evidence in this case established that the taxpayer made a use of the, the display furniture, showing it, right. assembling it, whatnot, and, and combined with that... Right, they, but my point is, even let's assume that's true, the exemption applies to use. It, it allows you to use property, and still the exemption applies, provided the property was purchased for resale. For resale, correct. Right. And I, that's what I was about to get to. You have all this use, you know, assembling it, staging it, using it as a demonstration model, and then you have a significant period of time where it wasn't for sale. It wasn't, it was, they, they would refuse to sell the furniture. 
Um, yes, there were some exemptions. If, if they were done, if, they, if the model had been discontinued and they weren't gonna sell it, if there were no more units of, you know, similar units in the warehouse, they were finished using the sample unit on the floor. So they, they were done using it, then they would sell it. They would sell it under, you know, extraordinary circumstances where someone has a dinner party that night or a, someone coming in from out of town or a product was damaged. These, these rare circumstances, of course, the floor models were sold, but the default, the vast majority of the sales didn't come from the floor. They would, would refuse to sell those. So it's the combination of use and failure to sell that makes this interim use taxable. But you would acknowledge that virtually all of them were ultimately sold. For sure. Eventually they were all sold. This is not a situation where the items were permanently di diverted from, from inventory, like the IBM case or the Conoco case. But you know, A.B. Hirschfeld was a temporary diversion. Martin Marietta was a temporary diversion and then subsequent sales. So that by itself uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't negate the, the use tax here. Council, let me give you another hypothetical, yep. a pretty common one. Um, showroom models of automobiles. Yep. All right, so your position would be, because they're showroom models, they might eventually be sold, but they're being used to sell everything else. So I take it your position would be those should be treated just like uh, the furniture. The only, the only difference, I think, in that is that I, I would bet that if you walked into any car dealership and you wanted to buy the, the showroom model, they'll sell it to you, without a doubt. There's not a reluctance. There's not an encouragement. Now, take the one off the back lot. Take the one out of our, out of our garage. They'll sell you the one you want. It's a big ticket item, and those sales don't come across very often. So I think though, that's the difference there. In Lakewood, the city council has legislatively determined to provide an exemption for automobile demonstration use. And the fact that the city council felt that that was appropriate kind of tends to suggest that in the absence of that, maybe it would have been taxable. So, and there is no exemption for the demonstration use of furniture or any other tangible personal property. It's specifically uh, limited to motor vehicles. Now, but we do have double taxation here because you've conceded every one of these four models is sold. Mm -hmm. And every time that happens, the purchaser pays sales tax. Yes. So on the same item, we get a use tax and a sales tax. Yes. Okay. And that's, that those are two distinct taxable events, which A.B. Hirschfeld specifically acknowledges. As but, the, but, but, the, but the property, the, the thing that's being sold eventually hasn't changed. Well, I mean, it, it, got, it, it got assembled. Changed. It got, yeah, but they all get assembled, whether they're on the right. floor or not. Right. Okay, so it, it, when they got it, to when they eventually sell it, it hasn't changed and it's being taxed twice. Well, um, there's two different taxable events. One is the use as a demonstration model with a failure to, re to resell it, except for limited circumstances. And then there is a sale where the customer pays the sales tax. So it's different taxpayers, different events. This is not a situation of a value added tax or a double taxation situation. So uh, council, but I thought the initial ahead. taxable event, in your view, was the initial purchase. Purchase, it right. is. Is it the purchase or the use? Because you just said the use. Well, it's, it's the use that, that triggers a, recalcul a recharacterization of the initial purchase. You're correct. The taxable event is the sale of the, the original purchase of it, and it's the taxpayer's use and failure to resell that causes the recharacterization of that initial purchase to be a retail one. So when exactly is the first taxable event complete in your mind? Is it the very day they take it off, take it out of the warehouse, assemble it, put it on the showroom floor for a day and say, we're not gonna sell it for this day. Right. We're gonna have it only for display. Is that right then exactly when the taxable event happens? And if not, how many days? The, well, the, the first taxable event is actually the purchase right, of the you, item. No, but you're saying it's and not then, actually triggered until the use. Until later. How long? One day? One year? What, when, exactly? it, when it's used and it's not offered, for, when it's not available for sale. So for one day? One day. So, One day. so why does it matter whether the furniture here was on the, sh on the floor for six months, a year, or a day? Under th your theory, it doesn't matter at all. I think, it, I think it shows the extent to which it was used. I mean, this is not, this is not necessarily a game of exactute. I mean, but six you, you, to 12 but you months. you just said it doesn't matter whether it was one day or one year, so if, if they, under if, your theory. Correct, if they use okay. it for one day and they don't sell it, that's not a, that's not a purchase for resale, okay. exactly. There's not a time limitation, I think, that, that would apply. Another area where the district court um, uh, erred was looking at the actual, not looking at the actual conduct. Counsel, you, you said something that interested me. You said purchase for resale. Isn't it undisputed that when they bought every one of these items, they intended to resale it? 
at that the point, time? they so, were. So why did that just evaporate? Well, no, that, that's, the whole, that's the whole holding in the IBM versus Charnes case, where a subsequent events can cause a recharacterization of a prior purchase that was originally characterized as a wholesale but, to be transformed into the retail one. But in this particular instance, under these facts, it never, they never lost the intent to resell. Well, they, they, it wasn't as if they changed their mind about what they were going to do with it. Well, they did when they refused to sell the product. I mean, it was a temporary refusal to sell, but there was a significant period where they didn't want to sell. The customers preferred the stuff out of the, infant, out of the box, the new stuff that hasn't been, that hasn't been sat on and laid on. Um, when, they, when they chose not to sell it, it that's, that's when they changed their mind. Well, but, but isn't the evidence that if I walked in wanted to buy that piece of furniture that was, that was being uh, demoed, and I insisted on it, they were going to give it to me. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the case. That, that's, again, you know, where the court relied upon the subjective intent. The, the court order is replete with this was available to sell. The, the salespeople or the manager had the discretion right. to sell. Compare that to what actually happened. A.B. Hirschfeld requires you to look at the actual conduct, and they didn't sell those things except in limited circumstances. They didn't sell them. At the outset. At the outset, correct. Not for six to 12 months later. Um, I see that my time is, is taken, but I hope I answered your question satisfactorily. Thank you very much. Thank you, Good afternoon. I'm Neil Pomerantz, FAR number 24741, on behalf of the appellees who we refer to collectively as Furniture Row. May it please the court. I'd like to uh, jump to uh, a number of the questions that were asked by the court of Mr. Wilson, um, both having to do with the language of the Lakewood Municipal Code. The first uh, series of questions had to do with whether or not effectively this is a tax imposition case or a tax exemption case. And Judge Jones, I think you um, correctly asked the question whether or not the uh, uh, imposition of the tax uh, solely on retail sales is a question of imposition or exemption. And it is a, a question of imposition in the first instance. Because the did code the trial was, court treat it as an exemption, however? The trial court did use the language of an exemption. And, and there's actually there's two different things going on. Uh, there's first and foremost, there's a reservation of the tax to retail sales. And uh, the code expressly excludes from tax wholesale sales. So you first have to determine whether or not you have a transaction that falls within the code's definition of a wholesale sale. And you clearly do. Wholesale sales are described as a sale by wholesalers to re retail merchants for resale. Furniture Row is clearly a retail merchant. Uh, they purchase uh, goods from wholesalers for resale. That's a question, first and foremost, of imposition, not exemption. Uh, to address a, a, a point that Mr. Wilson made, the Coors Brewing case, which also was a wholesale uh, sale type of case, had a different statutory uh, regime. There, the, uh, the tax was not limited to uh, retail sales. It simply imposed tax on all sales. So you arguably needed an exemption to carve away from the tax base wholesale sales. Here in Lakewood, you don't need that. The tax is limited to retail transactions. Now, separately, in addition to the tax on retail sales, there is also an exemption. And this may have been what the trial court was referring to when it used the term exemption. There is an exemption for the storage, use, or consumption of any tangible personal property purchased for resale in the regular course of a business. I'm excerpting the key language there. Um, so, if there so were otherwise. We seem like we have both. We have, we have both. an exemption that perfectly mirrors the imposition. It, it, you know, I, this I applies except A, and by the way, this doesn't apply to A. You know, you, you might say that it reaffirms the limitation of tax yeah. uh, to retail transactions, but I think it also exists to address the point that Your Honor made a few moments ago, which is that it acknowledges that there may be an act of use or consumption that precedes the ultimate retail sale but that will be exempted from tax nonetheless because the ultimate intent, the ultimate purpose uh, remained to resell the good. And do you think it ultimately matters to the whether you win or lose, whether we call this an imposition case or an exemption case? I don't. 
I don't. I, I think the, the uh, statutes are very clear, and I think the facts, particularly as they were uh, found by the trial court after three days of extensive testimony, uh, shows that whether you apply it as uh, imposition provision or you apply the exemption language, uh, at all times this was a purchase that was made uh, for resale. And the intent of Furniture Row throughout, from the moment it purchased these items from its wholesalers until the moment uh, it ultimately resold uh, the furniture to its own retail customers, its intent remained and its conduct remained uh, to, to resell it. In the words of the primary purpose test, its primary purpose never changed. It was always to resell. Um, I, I, I'd also like to sort of note that there's nothing particularly unique about the way this company conducts its business. Uh, uh, its, its activity is sort of common to uh, retailers, uh, you might say, for, for centuries. All they do is they go out and they purchase from wholesalers. Um, or they manufacture themselves for certain of their goods large quantities of items that they intend to resell. Uh, they store the majority of those goods in the warehouse. Uh, they put a limited number of their inventory on their showroom floors for display to their customers so the customers can see and feel what is available for purchase. There's nothing unique about that way of conducting business. I, I, think, I think, though, the distinction that it's tempted to be drawn here is, let's take a, a hypothetical, not so hypothetical, um, the supermarket sells soup, and it has cans of soup on the shelves, okay? Um, it might also have a whole bunch of cans of soup back where you can't see it, you know. Um, the cans of soup, the customer can just take them and buy them, okay? Whereas here, the customer can't just take the chair or take the desk or whatever. They can try it out, they can look at it, but uh, Big Sur really wants people to buy something that's in the back. Right. Um, I think, first of all, the, the uh, evidence in the record shows that everything that was on the showroom floor was available for sale. That was the specific finding of the trial court, that uh, everything in the showrooms is available for sale at the discretion of the sales personnel. Uh, the court identified, I think it was at least six specific circumstances in which those sales of showroom items regularly take place. But the court acknowledged that beyond that, sales could be made from the showroom floor whenever a, a salesperson believed it was prudent to make that sale or necessary to make that sale. And the court admitted into evidence lists of all of the sales that were made from the showroom floor. And there were literally thousands of those sales that were made during the audit period. The other point that I make in response to your question is um, retail establishments have all sorts of different preferences regarding the order in which they may choose or prefer to sell their goods. A grocery store, for example, may prefer to sell the items that are put out on display first, such that if you say, hey, I want a can of peas from the back, they're likely to discourage you from taking the can from the back because it's easier for them to sell from the floor first. Other retailers, like Furniture Row, would prefer to sell from the warehouse first and from their showroom floor later, in most cases. But that doesn't answer the ultimate question here, which is whether the goods, whether they're in the warehouse in the back or on the showroom floor in the front, whether they're being held for resale and whether the primary purpose of the retailer remains to resell those goods. And in this case, that's absolutely true for all of the inventory, whether on the showroom floor or in the warehouses. But counsel, as I understand um, Lakewood's argument is the retailer here's purpose changed over time. Maybe when they, the very first moment they purchased the furniture, they intended to resell it. But then when they took it out of the warehouse and assembled it, for that period of time, whether it was six months or a year, their primary purpose was not to sell that. Their primary purpose was to use it for something else. Secondarily, they would have sold it under certain circumstances, but primarily their goal was to use it for that period, and it's that period that they're trying to tax. What do you say to right. that? Well, you know, you have to, in, in order to determine what the primary purpose was during any period of time, you should apply the primary purpose factors that have been articulated by the courts, and the district court did that. The district court applied all five of the primary purpose factors to all of the activities that took place between the initial wholesale purchase by Furniture Row and the ultimate retail sale by Furniture Row and concluded that all of those factors individually and certain, certainly all of them collectively overwhelmingly show that the primary purpose remained throughout to resell those goods. There was never any different purpose. I think 
one area where we fundamentally part ways with the city is the city seems to think that the act of displaying goods that are for sale is somehow separate from the intent or the purpose to resell those goods. And we believe that displaying goods is an essential part of selling goods. It is fully consistent with the intent to resell goods. And I think that's what the district court found. Um, Is the primary purpose issue an issue of fact or of law? Uh, I think it's both. I think it's a mixed question. I think uh, it depends very heavily on findings of fact that the district court made. And the district court did make extensive findings of fact that are relevant to each of the primary purpose factors. The factors themselves and perhaps the, the uh, ultimate meaning of each of those factors, I think, do involve elements of law. Right. I don't think there is any dispute from the city about what the meaning as a matter of law uh, is of each of those five factors. I don't think there's been a dispute. The only question has been, what are the facts that have been proven in this case, and what answer do they command under the five primary purpose factors? Uh, you know, I would emphasize that the city has spent very little time in its briefs, certainly uh, in its argument today, identifying any of the specific uh, primary purpose factors or applying the facts to those factors. I think it's very clear that if you apply those factors, which are the relevant test, you can reach only one conclusion, that the primary purpose throughout for Furniture Row was to resell all of its inventory. Uh, the showroom inventory was just more inventory. It just happened to be uh, placed in the front of the stores. Council, I'm trying to get a handle on what is the point of this Hirschfeld test. Is it simply a, a guide to interpreting the ordinance? Is it somehow supposed to contradict? What if it contradicts the ordinance? Are we supposed to apply the factors instead of the ordinance? How does that work? Like, for example, what if the, there was a special statute that's titled taxing furniture? And regardless of whether the primary purpose of the purchase is, is, furniture, is use or resale, we, we dictate as a city council that this tax applies to this furniture. If, that, if it says that, does it matter what happens under the Hirschfeld test? Yeah, I, I think you could. Uh envision a statutory scheme that superseded the primary purpose test. If a uh, legislative body said, we want to tax all furniture uh, regardless, or all sh you know, displayed furniture, regardless of uh, any of the facts surrounding how it is displayed or what's done with it, uh, conceivably you could have a different standard that the legislature has said it wants to apply. You don't have that here. Um, and you don't really have that in any jurisdiction, certainly none that I'm aware of. You tend to have pretty straightforward, pretty general language that says either we tax only retail transactions, which was the case in Lakewood, or in some jurisdictions we tax all transactions. And ultimately you have to uh, determine whether or not the, the transaction at issue was one that was retail or wholesale without a whole lot of guidance from the legislature. And so that's why you have the common law test that's been developed, the primary purpose test, to help sort of navigate that, to, to, to use as a tool to determine whether or not you should view the subject transaction as a retail transaction or a wholesale transaction. And I think that's perfectly appropriate here, given a statutory scheme that just says, hey, we only tax uh, retail transactions. How do you determine if it's retail? You apply the primary purpose factors. This, the last uh, point I, I'd like to make is, and I think this also speaks to some of the questions that were asked of the city, is we do have double taxation here. And uh, I think the tax that the city proposes on the showroom uh, inventory really kind of uh, conflicts with basic fundamental principles governing sales and use taxes. We only tax final consumptive transactions. That's what the seminal IBM case says. And we only tax purchases by the final uh, consumer, by the end consumer. That's what the public service company uh, case says. Um, this is not a final consumptive transaction. When Furniture Row purchases inventory, whether it's to put it in the back in the warehouse or in the showroom floor, that's not a final consumptive transaction. The final consumptive transaction obviously takes place when there's the ultimate sale to the customer, uh, nor is it, uh, nor is a furniture row properly viewed as an end consumer, right? They're like most retailers. They purchase at wholesale, they sell it at retail. They're customers that are the, 
are the end consumers. And so the city's proposed tax would violate these fundamental principles and would amount to a double taxation. We don't tax goods multiple times as they pass through the stream of commerce. That's why we have these basic principles that, that say we don't tax wholesale transactions. We only tax retail transactions. But, but, but couldn't there be an economic justification in this kind of circumstance because you have a, a property or goods that because of the, their nature and their use have depreciated? And so were the city taxing those goods um, you know, out of the warehouse, you know, it's at one price, but when it's taxing the goods later, a year later, on a lower price, it's not getting the same revenue. So wouldn't there be an economic justification then for imposing these two taxes? Right, so I'd answer that in, in two different ways. First, factually, the record shows that the discounts that were applied uh, to the showroom items were not materially different from discounts that were applied to items sold out of the warehouse. This is an industry where uh, discounts are common, and the evidence showed that there were often substantial discounts of items that were sold from the warehouse. At the same time, the often items that were sold fro from the showroom floor were sold at full price. Right? So there was no material difference in the prices that were charged. Uh, from a legal perspective, the law does not ask whether or not there was uh, a different price that might have been charged had a different series of events occurred. Uh, it is often the case that a retailer will buy at a certain price and resell even at below cost. You really have to determine ultimately whether it's a retail transaction, and if it's a retail tra tra transaction, tax is charged based upon the purchase price in the retail transaction. Um, and you know, if, it's a, if the original purchase, here the purchase by furniture row of its inventory, were considered the retail transaction, you'd look to that original cost. In other words, y you don't try to determine whether or not there's any um, economic diminution of value. You, you ultimately have to answer the question that we've been talking about, is it a uh, retail purchase or a wholesale purchase? Thank you. Thank you, Council, for your arguments this afternoon. Um, case will be deemed submitted, and we'll issue an opinion in due course. We are going to have uh, one more argument this afternoon on the 2.30 docket, uh, but we are going to take a brief recess uh, before that so the bailiff may announce the recess.
Good afternoon. Uh, welcome again to Division 7 of the Court of Appeals. Uh, obviously, counsel for the appellant has already heard my spiel, um, and you may have as well. Do you have any questions concerning my or our procedures? Okay. Um, again, well, there's only one person in the courtroom, no cell phones, and um, the toggle switch does work, I think, to raise and lower the podium. Uh, counsel for the appellant, you can attempt to save time, but as you've seen, it often depends on how the questioning goes, whether you're able to save time for rebuttal. But we're ready to proceed. Good afternoon. My name is David Furtado. My attorney registration number in the state of Colorado is 28002. I represent the plaintiff appellant in this case, High Impact LLC. May it please this court. This case is about whether or not defendant appellee State Farm Fire and Casualty Company must pay for its insurance contractor's compliance with the city of Aurora's adopted building code and adopted design criteria for roofing and manufacturing specifications pursuant to the terms of its policy of insurance with its insured, who hired the contractor, the plaintiff appellant in this case. In answering this question, I believe one must understand that the 2009 International Residential Code, from now on, Your Honors, I will call it the IRC, adopted by the city of Aurora contains both a testing criteria and a design criteria. As the city of Aurora is in a high wind region, the city established additional criteria regarding the performance design for replacement roof shingles. This design criteria was that the property's replacement shingles must be able to withstand sustained winds of 85 miles per hour or wind gusts up to 100 miles per hour for three seconds. <clears throat> Due to this requirement, the plaintiff in this case installed an upgraded shingle. It's called an RFG 300 shingle, and the reason he installed that shingle, or the plaintiff installed that shingle rather, is because that shingle contained an express warranty that stated it, it, it's able to sustain an 85 mile sustained wind and gust up to 100 miles per hour. The roofing shingle that defendant Apelli State Farm Fire and Casualty Insurance Company authorized was an Owens Corning roofing shingle in which, which only contained an express warranty for sustained winds of the 660 miles per hour and did not contain any wind gust warranty. Defendant Apelli State Farm Fire and Casualty Company refused to pay the extra expense associated with the contractor installing the roof compliant shingle, which was only the cost of the shingle. There's no additional labor charge. In addition to the wind speed warranty that the city of Aurora adopted, the wind speeds rather they adopted, they also stated that the contractor must file manufacturer installation instructions when installing a roof. It is important to note that the shingles defendant approved are not approved by the manufacturer for high wind speed installation. That's at the court file at 185 in the plaintiff's expert's report. In fact, there's a table in, in the 300s, 301.2 section one, which is part of the IRC, that the city of Aurora modified to state that its shingles shall be able to sustain three second gusts of 100 miles per hour and 85 mile hour sustained winds. Council, yes, I, I thought it was undisputed that the shingles in this case that State Farm offered to pay for actually met that standard and that what you are simply complaining about is that, but they wouldn't warrant it. But as, a, but as a testing matter, as a design matter, they met the standard. Your Honor, uh, that's where I think the record is not clear from the lower court, and I'd like to clarify for the Court of Appeals. The lower court only looked at the testing standard. Every shingle in the, in the country is tested. They have to test them under, it's, it's R905.2.4.1, and that's they're tested for manufacturing and labeling and packaging. That's one standard of the IRC. Where the lower court, we believe, made an error was that it didn't look at the design standard. And what we're saying is the design standard is that the roof must be designed so the shingle can withstand that 85 mile an hour sustained wind of the 100 mile an hour gust. And we believe as a matter of public policy, Your Honor, that the roof should be, the shingles be warranted for that. If the manufacturer is not warranting it for a particular purpose, then it must not be able to do that purpose. Well, I don't think that follows. I yes, mean, Your Honor. Uh, a manufacturer of any product might design it to withstand 
uh, use in excess of what it's willing to warrant for because the product is out of its control uh, and it doesn't know what's going to happen to it. And besides, there's nothing requiring them to warrant anything. Um, so I, I don't think it follows that just because you create a product that is designed to meet this level that you have to warranty at that level. But Your Honor, if it's not warranty to that, that, we, that level, if the contractor installs it on a roof, we believe it would be in violation of the UCC and the Cargo Consumer Protection Act. All right, well, that wasn't in your complaint, as I understand it. That it wasn't, Your Honor. Okay, so that, you can't raise new arguments on appeal. I understand, Your Honor, what the court stated, but I believe if you look at the design requirement of, of this roofing material, as opposed to the testing requirement, Your Honor, then what would be the point of putting a roof, manufacturing a roof, or putting in, designing a roof, installing a roof, that it's not warranty to do it. So if it's not warranty to do it, it must not be able to do it. And in fact, Your Honor. That, I'm just saying that the, doesn't follow. I mean, the fact that something isn't warranted to do something doesn't mean it can't do it. It just means that the manufacturer of that product has chosen not to warrant it at that level. It's hedging its bets. That's just commerce. I understand, Your Honor, but usually when, when roofers are installing roofs, and they're telling a homeowner that this is City of Aurora's code compliance on this, that it has to sustain 85 mile of sustained winds in 100 mile hour gusts. I believe that the contractor and the, and the insurer would make the decision to make sure the roof on the house is warranted by the manufacturer to actually do that. But, but I, I'm just, this is, you're saying the code requires, the code requires. Where does the code require a warranty of anything? It doesn't, Your Honor. I'm saying that, that you can imply that the lower court could have implied that if the code states it's a design criteria, like Your Honor, it's not a testing criteria. There's a big thing design and testing. Testing means that the ASTMs tested that, tested that material. And furthermore, Your Honor, the ASTM, when they test those shingles, it's never at those speeds. It's a 35 mile an hour wind that's put into a tunnel under laboratory conditions and they extrapolate out. That's part of the problem with the argument. Just because the ASTM says it may do that doesn't mean it will do that. And what I'm stating, Your Honor, is that if the insured is insured and they live in the city of Aurora, and the city of Aurora is trying to ensure that for safety, that three tab shingles don't blow off roofs, if you're gonna put a three tab shingle on the roof that's not warranty for that particular purpose, that would seem to tell me that the manufacturer is not safe, or no, rather the manufacturer did not design that shingle to do that. Just because it can do something doesn't mean it should do something. And I understand the court's position on this, Your Honor, and I'm asking the Court of Appeals to look at the design criteria that's in section R301, 301.2 subparagraph one, in addition to title the 900s and 905 that I'm asking for. Because if you look at the court's order when the court found for the defendant on the motion for termination of law, the court only basically spoke about testing criteria, the ASTM says it can do this, the court never really analyzed the design criteria of, of why we're doing this. So in other words, like for instance, Your Honor, if the, if the city of Aurora is gonna say, we want roofs to perform in such a way, right? I believe that a contractor should, and an insured should for his neighbor's sake, ensure that roof can do that. That's what I'm, we're arguing, that because of the design, if the, a city of Aurora, if the city of Aurora did not adopt the design criteria, yeah, we lose. I get it, because it, ha it has an ASTM standard. But the city of Aurora specifically des adopts a design criteria and then fills in numbers. And in fact, Your Honor, almost every roofing shingle meets those design criteria, the t testing criteria, rather, 120 mile an hour winds, 150 mile an hour winds. But if the city of Aurora, when they added, and this is part of the record, when they added manufacturer specifications and the manufacturer of that shingle does not have any instructions for high wind installation, that would tell someone that I shouldn't be installing on this roof. It, there's no installation instructions for that, and furthermore, it's part of the record, they won't warranty it to do that. So if it can't do that, and you can't install it for that, it shouldn't be on the roof. That's why we think the lower court got it wrong. It, it just sounds like you're asking us to add language to the code. I mean, it's, it has a design criteria. I think it's undisputed they met the design criteria. I mean, but you're saying, oh, it says this, but it should mean that. Well, that's not what we do. We don't rewrite statutes. We don't rewrite ordinances. We don't say it would be a good idea if it said this. Of course. That's up to the entity that adopted it. 
But we're asking for a remand, Your Honor, to the trial court so the trial court can address that design because it didn't address the design criteria. It didn't address that specific question. I'm not asking the court to say, yes, Mr. Furtado, you are right. I'm going to interpret the, the law to mean this, and we're going to add law. You interpret the law, of course. The court of appeals may interpret the law, but what we're asking is we're asking for the court of appeals to remand to the trial court to review the design criteria under the R. Let me get my place again. Why, why, why is the trial court any better position than we are to read the law and the design criteria? Because, Your Honor, the trial court didn't do that. Is there the anything? The granted, no, why, why, they, should, why do we have to remand for the trial court to do it? Why can't we do it? Why, are the, why is the court in a better position than us to read the ordinance and design criteria? Your Honor, I believe you can. I, be, I believe the court of appeals can interpret law. But what I'm saying is if there's not enough direction, and I believe the trial court just missed it, then it would, I believe it would be remanded to the trial court to have them look at the design criteria, have the judge look at the design criteria to address it in its order. Is there anything in the record from the trial court that indicates that the shingles were non-compliant with the Aurora requirements? Your Honor, um, what the trial court concentrated on, Your Honor, was he concentrated on the ASTM standard and said that due to the fact the shingle met that standard, that right. it was okay. And the fact is that the court then said because the city of Aurora doesn't say the shingle must be warranted to this, that's, what, that's how the trial came to its, to its conclusion, in my opinion, that this, he made a specific, a specific ruling that because the city of Aurora didn't say it must be warranted to this, that it should be installed. What I'm saying to the court, I think if the court looks at both the design criteria and the testing criteria, it's only logical that you would say, yes, if it says it, says it has to be designed for this. And, and, the, and the key point here, uh, Your Honors, is that there's a manufacturer specification also if the manufacturer does not have a high wind installation instruction, you cannot install it that way. And Aurora is saying in their code they're a high wind geographical area. They're calling themselves that. And there's other ways to vary the, to vary the code, Your Honor. Like if, if the insurance companies don't want to pay for a better roof, they can, they can go to the city of Aurora and say lower that. But the city of Aurora knows what's best for its citizens. And what I'm saying is a matter of public policy in this court, a contract should not be allowed to put a shingle on a roof that doesn't, that's not warranted to the gust or the sustained winds. I believe that to me is we do as neighbors and we make sure, because if you look at the reason why, as stated in the expert report, why they, why they passed that is the, they say, the expert said at CF 193, wind resistance warranty is to cover the shingles from not blowing off or being damaged or lifting up and not losing their seal. That's what the city of Aurora is worried about, a shingle blowing off and hitting someone. Or a, a, a wind comes through, like we had a lot of storms this summer, a lot of massive storms here, and winds come through and you start blowing shingles off. That creates another problem. If well, shingle, the, yes, the, Your Honor. But the code addresses that. The shingle addresses that. I don't see how the warranty addresses that, the safety issue. It, well, it does, the, Your the, Honor. The, no, it goes beyond that. Um, if, if the shingle is tested to withstand these speeds, then that takes care of the safety concern. I mean, warranty is about reimbursing the owner. That's not about safety. Your Honor, let me take that question in two parts. Most shingles manufactured will do a sustained win. Most. They could easily have said, as long as ASTM says this, you install it. I believe because they said they put the design criteria as a second prong and said it must be able to do this. If the, warrant, if, the, if the warranty is not telling the consumer it can do this, in my opinion, it can't do that. Well, I, I'm confused. The design criteria says, quote, wind speed, colon, mm -hmm. 100 miles per hour for three second gust, end quote. That's yes. a design criteria. Design meaning how it's manufactured. Manufactured, common meaning of design. Um, and I think it's undisputed that these, these tiles meet that. Your Honor, I believe the design means the design of the roof itself, not the design of the, of the, I mean, the design of the roof that the contract is installing. That's why it's in the same, it's in the same paragraph as manufacturing installation instructions. So we may have a different meaning of the word design, but my, inter my take on design is the roof itself, because the code is for the roof, not, not for the shingle. It's what the, how the roof should perform with the shingles on the roof, and the shingles go on a roof and, and makes a roof. If the, if the code is saying for safety reasons why shingles blowing off a roof, the design, I believe, Your Honor, is for the roof, not the way the shingles are designed, but the way the roof is, is manufactured 
with those, with those shingles, Your Honor. Even though the design criteria is, is design criteria for roof shingles? Yes, Your Honor. It's for roof shingles to put on a roof. It's for the function of the roof. That's, that's what a roof shingle does. If the roof shingles put on a roof to do a function, which is to keep water and water out of the house, snow from melting out of the house, and of course not to blow off. If there's no further questions, Your Honor, I'd like to leave my last 50 seconds for rebuttal. Sure. Thank you. Your Honors, the trial court got it right. This case Excuse is me, about. Counsel? Pardon? What is your name? Sorry. I'm Marilyn Chappelle, attorney registration number 14083, counsel for State Farm Fire and Casualty Company, and with me here at the table is John Sands. Thank you. So I apologize for jumping ahead of myself. The trial court got it right, Your Honor, Your Honors. The issue here is whether State Farm, under the State Farm policy language, properly did not pay the upgrade for the shingles in question here. The policy language that we're concerned with here is similar construction and for the same use. These were three tab asphalt roofing shingles, the same sort of shingles that were on the roof before the June 2014 hail event and wind event. This is not a case like Dupre, Your Honors. The shingles for which uh, that State Farm estimated and paid for, the replacement shingles, met the Aurora City Code. And uh, if those shingles had been used, uh, Ms. Bethel's house would have been habitable and functional. Your Honor, you asked a lot of questions about uh, the IRC, the 2009 IRC, and uh, the interplay with uh, uh, the plaintiff's contention that there should be a warranty, a manufacturer wind speed warranty superimposed on that. That requirement is not in the State Farm policy language, and so we need to look at the code. And, Your Honor, as Mr. Furtado uh, showed us in his opening brief attachment, the Aurora City Council in 2011 adopted the 2009 IRC by ordinance. And if you look at that ordinance after, on page 8 after they adopted the, the IRC, the Aurora City Council did something else. The Aurora City Council went on for six pages of this ordinance and said, these are all the changes that we're going to make to the 2009 IRC. Now, the Aurora City Code in 2011 could have said, we are going to require that shingles installed in roofs in Aurora meet, uh, have a manufacturer wind speed warranty that meets the uh, three second, 100 mile per hour, 85 basic mile per hour wind speed. They could have done that. They didn't. The Aurora City Council in those uh, six pages of changes to the IRC could have said, in the city of Aurora, we are not going to allow three tab asphalt shingles. They could have done that and they didn't. So to answer the questions from before as to whether this court or the trial court should make that determination, the response is the Aurora City Council should make that determination. They didn't do it for the time period at issue here. They could do it now if they wanted to. But that answers the question. With regard to the discussion about the design versus performance criteria, Your Honors, that interplay is answered in the record. If you go to page CF 685, that table, uh, table R905.2.4.1 paren 1 from the 2009 IRC, correlates the basic wind speed requirements in uh, uh, 301.2 paren 4 of the 2009 IRC with the uh, section R905 requirements. In other words, it takes the, what Aurora did, the wind speed requirement, and it has in the same table 
what the uh, ASTM D7158 requirements are. And in that table you see that, and this is all in the record, that the shingles that State Farm estimated and paid for are class H. And again in the record, that means that those shingles are good for a wind speed exceeding 100 miles per hour, and even from the chart in the record, up to 130 and even 150 miles per hour. So again, Your Honor, there's this case, there, there's no case law really on point here that I've been able to find, and uh, apparently Mr. Furtado hasn't either. I'm sure he would have cited it to us. So again, we're looking at the policy language of the State Farm policy, interpreted under Colorado uh, legal principles of interpreting insurance contracts, and we're looking at the language of the Aurora Building Code, again with the ordinance and, and uh, adopting the IRC, the 2009 IRC, and what the I 2009 IRC says. Again, Your Honors, there's nothing in the, either the State Farm policy language or the 2009 IRC, or the Aurora City Code that requires a superimposition of a manufacturer wind speed warranty above and beyond the policy language or the building code. If the Aurora City Council wants to change that, it can do so, but it did not for the time period at issue here. Council? Okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think your opposing counsel was um, advocating that we remand for the trial court to consider some of these criteria that the trial court really did not address in its order, and I'm wondering your position on that. Your Honor, I think the trial court did address it because the trial court incorporated the chart uh, that I mentioned earlier in its discussion of whether the, sh the shingles that State Farm estimated and paid for met the standard. So I think it, it implicitly did do so. It determined that the shingles met the Aurora wind speed standard. And by the way, Your Honors, there's no dispute that the ASTM testing standard was met by those shingles. That's obvious from uh, the briefing. But I, Your Honor, I, I think that's the response, that it, it's in there in the, in, it could, perhaps it could have been discussed somewhat differently, but it is there. Council, I think, um though the high impact is drawing a distinction between the testing standard and the design standard, saying that the design standard wasn't addressed. So how, how does the information in the record show that the design standard was met? Your Honor, again, by reference to the table that takes this, the Article 3 portion of the IRC and combines it with the Article 9 portion of the IRC, and the, the discussion that these shingles, again, under the testing standard, uh, met the wind speed requirement. So again, I, I think if you look at that table in the IRC, it answers the question that they, it does correlate those requirements. Perhaps it could have been done more, you know, in some more discussion. Again, there's no case law that's, that I've been able to find, again, that expressly discusses these issues. But, Your Honor, again, we come back down to what the policy language says. And the policy language here says similar construction and for the same use. And that language was met here. But th that language requires property that's compliant with the Aurora City Code, correct? Yes, and these shingles are compliant right. with the Aurora City right. Code. But it's not just that it's the same material as used before. It also has to meet the criteria of the code. Uh, your Honor, and the shingles did meet the right, criteria. Right, I understand, but yes. it's, it's, it's right. not just, well, the, you got right. the same bad shingles before, so you get them now. If they don't meet the code, you don't, you're not supposed to imp, uh, apply the new shingle, or the bad shingles, so to speak. Right, but here, that, that's yeah. not, uh, they did meet the code. Your Honor, I, I would also point out in the record uh, on the discussion of three-tab shingles, if you look at uh, CF-768, there's reference to a City of Aurora document, single-family residential re-roofing, uh, as including either three-tab or laminate 
you know, the upgraded shingles. So that, that is in the record as well with regard to the three tab shingles. Your Honors, uh, if there are no further questions, I would just ask that you affirm the trial court's determination on the uh, motions for determination of law, uh, again, with the stipulation of the parties that the sole issue was on the shingle upgrade here. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Furtado, you have about 50 seconds left. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have one statement to make to respond to what counsel for defendants stated, and that is, if the city of Aurora meant for a shingle to be used from the ASTM standard, it could have simply said in the title 301.2.4, use H, use G. That's why I think there's a, there's a disparity here, because the, the city of Aurora could have said, in 905.2.4.1, where it has the shingles G and H, it could have said in 301.2.4, they could have put a G or an H in there. So I believe the design criteria was made more than just the, US, than just the ASTM standard, Your Honor. Thank you so much for your time today, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you for your arguments. Thank you. The case will stand submitted. That's the only uh, case on our docket for this afternoon. So the court will be in recess and the bailiff may so announce.